Thank you so much, Marnie, and welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending upon from where you're joining. And I'm joining you from the mountains of Western North Carolina, Cherokee land, East Coast time, currently um, wet, vibrant, green, mysterious mountains. I want to begin by just expressing my appreciation for Song Alive. I first met Martin Aylward, the founder, who many of you know, just over a decade ago, and I have been so uh, blessed to be part of this community since its inception and uh, the web of connection, of spiritual friendship, the incredible teachers that they gather, just knowing what it takes to build community. So a shout out of appreciation to everyone involved. And as we get started today, let's just pause together before moving into meditation to acknowledge the uh, necessity the gift, the importance of taking time uh, to presence this particular topic, courageous conversations and speaking from the heart. Just connecting for a moment with what it is that inspired you to be here today, or whether you are listening to the recording Many of us acknowledge that these are times of great divisiveness and polarization, the tear in the fabric of human relationship. Many of us acknowledge that speaking from the heart is a liberation practice in itself in our day-to-day -day ordinary lives and on our paths of leadership, and so I'm touched that you're all here, that we're joining together. I'll share reflections after the meditation, but then we'll move into um, what tends to be my favorite part, and that's reciprocal exchange. Just time to rest in shared presence together and to see what questions, what inquiries are alive today, okay? So let's begin by accessing beginner's mind, curious, open, refreshing our perception lens. Please find whatever position you choose to meditate in today as I am nursing a minor injury, I'll be standing today. If you're choosing a seated position, please allow yourself to find a posture guided by the body that feels settled, grounded, relaxed and upright at the same time. I invite you to either close your eyes or rest your eyes in a soft gaze. Eyes relax in their sockets. Receptive. And let's together take in three of the slowest and deepest breaths we've taken today.
simply inviting your breath to begin to relax you. Feeling the massage of breath from within. As your breath returns to its organic rhythm. Don't be the breather, simply allow your breath to breathe you. Become aware of your connection with gravity and the ground below. And invite yourself to soften and settle even more into the support of the earth below. And as we move into deep listening within and out, deep listening as the foundation for speaking from the heart, deep listening as the essence or foundation of meditation, listening to life as it unfolds moment by moment. Just allow yourself to become more aware of what's moving through the inner and outer landscapes. Anchored in body and breath. The invitation is to welcome yourself, to welcome life exactly as it is. And to begin to let go of everything that is not original to this moment. Letting go, letting down the path. Letting down the future.
releasing managing mind. Preoccupation, assessment, simply inviting ourselves to go beyond the realm of concepts and ideas and labeling, and to simply rest in shared presence. Nothing to do, friends, nothing to make happen, nowhere to get to, and nothing to strive for. Thinking of meditation not as something we do, but as a natural remembering of who and what we already are. Not as something we do, but as being who we already are. So just notice what is here for you in the mirror of stillness today. Recognizing the great honoring that being with life as it is expresses.
And as we rest in listening within and out, please be aware of all that is arising, passing, moving through all that is changing. And allow yourself to equally be aware of that which is not changing. Awareness itself, the field through which everything arises and passes. If you notice efforting, give yourself permission to soften effort. Seeing if you can practice resting and listening. Not listening to as subject, object, like an I doing my meditation. Maybe think of it as listening to the pulse of life as the pulse of life, just resting into that. Nothing you have to do. Just resting in your innate receptivity. while the mind of separation is loud and lives in shallow waters. Whole mind is quiet and lives in deep waters. It hears the sound of our heart beating. The space between our thoughts, the rhythmic pulse of embodiment. As you take in now a deep, full body breath, I'd like to share a quote by Howard Thurman, 
that I feel is so foundational to our topic today. And so just allow yourself to receive these words and notice how they land within you. There is something in every one of you that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine in yourself. It is the only true guide you will ever have. And if you cannot hear it, you will all your life spend your days on the ends of strings that someone else pulls. Thank you, Howard Thurman. Just taking that in. Such a clear instruction about both listening and speaking from the heart. Friends, let's take in together one more conscious breath. Inhaling deeply. And letting go. Gently opening your eyes. And the invitation now is to continue to rest in listening as meditation together and to take our seats, uh, a Zen instruction that points physically and metaphorically, to how we choose to show up in each moment, uh, to show up aligned with ourselves, present, resting in the support of the earth below. I want to start today's reflections with a quote from Gandhi. And the quote is, before speaking, please consider whether it is an improvement upon the silence. Yeah. And I love this quote because it points to receptivity as the seat of authentic expression. Some of you are here uh, simply for support for an existing practice of speaking from the heart. Some of you are here uh, because you practice public speaking and you work with the dimensions of fear or uh, self-consciousness that can arise around that. Some of you are here specific for the topic of courageous conversations and there are specific conversations you know that are yours to have. So my hope is that this serves everyone who's present today. Um, I want to share a metaphor that some of you have heard me share if you've worked with me before. From many decades ago, when I was a young person, spending some time studying the health of coral reefs, 
And many of us know that uh, globally, coral reefs are in uh, a dire situation, that many of them have died or are threatened and struggling. And one of the things that happens to threaten the wellness of a coral reef, which is a living organism that can extend for over 100,000 miles, okay, and maintains its communication, its balance, its protection, its systems through subtle vibration. When a loud, noisy motorboat comes to the surface of the waters, that's one of the things that can disrupt the capacity for the reef to hear and recognize its own subtle vibration. And I remember recognizing as a young person that this is a great metaphor, and it was back then, for how my own mind of separation seemed to operate. That when I gave my attention, when I was shallow listening rather than dropped in deep listening, shallow listening to simply the narrative or surface stories without dropping deeper into the field of spacious awareness itself, there was uh, a great disconnect within. There was an inability to hear my own subtle vibration, to hear and honor my truth, we could say, to hear and recognize uh, information that came through the subtle body, to uh, receive the communications that came from field consciousness, because I was so distracted by the loud motorboat. Just curious, a show of hands, if anyone at any point in your practice can relate with that metaphor. Yeah, yeah. So deep listening as the essence of speaking from the heart. There's a beautiful quote by Adrienne Marie Brown, where she says, I love the idea of shifting from mile wide, inch deep movements to inch wide, mile deep movements that schism the existing paradigm. And this really points to the power of relational presence and the recognition of how we show up to the relational field um, as uh, an opportunity for both healing, personal and collective, an opportunity for transformation, um, an opportunity for liberation, for expressing from who and what we actually are. Also a quote by Cornel West, who says, justice is what love looks like in public. So, so much of what we're going to talk about today is about uh, the how of dropping into presence and letting ourselves speak through love in the wide spectrum, the wide limitless language that love can express in, okay? And just to start very simply, um, I come from the Zen tradition, and I remember early on in my practice hearing about Suzuki Roshi, who brought Soto Zen to the United States and was founding teacher at Green Gulch Farm, where I trained early on in my practice, that he would when speaking to a large group of silent meditators, say, express yourself fully. Express yourself fully. While people were resting in zazen, in silent presence. And I find this so significant because it reminds us that not all expression has to come through voice, through words. That simply by dropping into shared presence, we are, we remember ourselves as, we um, recognize ourselves as the true expression of interbeing. And you all know that when it comes to listening to another, listening to yourself, really the most important element is resting in the pause, listening to the invisible aspects of communication, both internally and with others. And this is how we find our authentic voice in my experience. Um, this is a moment in time in the dominant paradigm where I feel that expressiveness is sort of overly valued, like the yang is valued over the yin instead of the both and. So for every 
conversation we find ourselves in an expectation that we need to have a, a solid opinion or more and more people communicating through forms like social media and Facebook and from my witnessing a kind of needing to express without dropping equally into receptivity. So one of the teachings I love through Dharma practice is that innate balance but of the yin and the yang, the receptive and the expressive, that they go hand in hand, that is through our embodiment of deep listening that we receive the guidance of our inner compass, uh, the words that are an expression of responsive presence, direct response to each moment, okay? A. Hey Dogen, uh, 12th century founder of Soto Zen, says in the Song of the Precious Mirror Samadhi, light and darkness are a pair, like the foot before and the foot behind in walking. Each thing has its own intrinsic value and is related to everything else in function and position. So I hear this so deeply speaking to the balance of the yin and the yang, expression, voice, and listening. Yeah. So just notice how my words are touching you. Okay. Speaking from the heart is a liberation practice. Uh, many of us get caught in the idea of separate self, subject, object, perception. And so it takes the form of I need to give a presentation to an audience or I separate self could say something that would be judged and rejected. And we're gonna unpack that a little bit and talk about some of the survival strategies that perhaps we've developed based on traumas that have happened in the relational field. But it's important to remember that we have a choice in every moment and a choice of how we show up to the relational field uh, as a full expression of our practice. So just pause, taking in a conscious breath. I want to reread the quote by Howard Thurman for a moment. There's something in every one of you that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine in yourself. It is the only true guide you will ever have. And if you cannot hear it, you will all your life spend your days on the ends of strings that someone else pulls. Just curious to invite people again. I'm going to take a look around, a show of hands if at some point in your life, maybe now, maybe earlier in your practice, you can relate to that. Maybe in certain instances where it's harder for you to find um, the truth within. Just show of hands. Yeah, yeah. There's also a great quote by Martha Graham. And I'm going to share this one, especially because I feel that when we really drop into speaking from the heart, and this is a, a path of letting the trance of separation dissolve, it's a means for dissolving that trance. It's that we get to drop into the uh, flow of interbeing, the natural, easeful, uh, already existing field of interconnection, the exchange. And that to me feels like a, a dance when we're really speaking it from the heart in an emergent way without a script dropped into presence. So Martha Graham said, there's a vitality, a life force, a quickening that is translated through you into action. And there's only one of you in all time. This expression is unique, and if you block it, it will never exist through any other medium and be lost. The world will not have it. It is not your business to determine how good it is, nor how it compares with any other expression. It's your business to keep it yours clearly and directly, to keep the channel open. You don't even have to believe in yourself 
or your work, you have to keep open and aware directly to the urges that motivate you. Keep the channel open. Hmm. So let's move into some basics. And I'm going to speak in very practical language uh, today. First, let's touch the basics of mindful speech. So simple, though not always easy, but to remember that there are ways we can use our voice that help us to show up to the relational field cleanly, that help us to live more freely of residue. In other words, when we overshare, there's often the residue of, oh, wow, I just overshared. I just uh, vo voice things that from center I wouldn't have. Um, I just abandoned myself or left presence through the field of communication. It feels really, really bad. And on the other side of things, there might be the residue of uh, leaving a meeting or a conversation, feeling that you underexpressed. You didn't say what was yours to say. Maybe you got talked out of it by the conditioned mind. And again, there's residue. Just to bring in one of my uh, favorite quotes, but another Suzuki Roshi piece of wisdom is um, an encouragement to live our lives as if we were a good bonfire. Living our lives as if we were a good bonfire, leaving no trace of ourself. So when we enter a conversation and we allow there to be the residue of oversharing, of missharing, of using our words to cause harm, or of undersharing, of dishonoring this being, there is uh, something left, yeah? So very simple questions we want to ask ourselves. And the first is, does something need to be expressed? Is there something that needs to be expressed? And if so, <laughs> because sometimes we find, no, this is something I still need to sit with. This is something I might need to sit a lot with. This is something I still haven't gotten at all clear enough in my own being to bring forth to uh, the person or persons that it involves. Second, is this something that needs to be said by me? Sometimes it is. Clearly, it's for me to express. It's my responsibility, my loving responsibility to express this. Sometimes it's crystal clear. No. It's for someone else. The next inquiry is, does this need to be said right now? Yeah, does this need to be said right now? And again, we listen within to the inner compass, to our internal feedback system, which is the feedback system both of our subtle body awareness of this body mind, and we can say the feedback system for all of life on earth, for the shared field of communication. So it's a place of wisdom. And sometimes we recognize now's not the time. Yeah. So that some simple questions that point us to basic mindful communication. Along these lines, many of you know that you like to check in to see if you feel resourced enough to have a courageous conversation, resourced enough to present something that feels edgy, or will stir discomfort, or might take every ounce of courage you have within you. So checking in, am I resourced? And maybe perhaps, is this is the person I'm going to share this with resourced? Is this the time? So even in my own home, uh, my husband and I have protective agreements about the morning. The morning is time for practice. It's time for our connection with the invisible, with the more than human world. I don't want to meet the human world without honoring fully my devotion to those realms. The evening is a time for rest. And so those aren't times when we would bring up certain topics that midday, as long as neither of us is in the middle of work and we're both available and resourced, that's good time. Likewise, many of us have learned, but I'm going to state it out loud because it feels so important that uh, there are forms of 
communication, which are useful for courageous conversations, voice to voice, face to face, not so much texting, not so much from my perspective, email. Take your own measure and know what your proper form of speaking from the heart is. Uh, but this is a place, just given the way our world is set up today, that I think we all uh, could be much kinder with each other about and much clearer with one another about. The relational field is a mirror. Uh, it's a mirror for what needs to be healed. It's a mirror for where each of us stands in relation to self-acceptance. And it's also an opportunity, a portal, a uh, portal a place of invitation for healing, okay? So just pause and notice how what I'm sharing is touching you or what it's stirring within you. Many of today's teachings come from a um, book that I've written many years ago called Relational Mindfulness a handbook for deepening our connection with ourself, each other, the planet. And some come from the book Luminous Darkness that I wrote more recently for those who want to go deeper. Let's take some time to just look at, um, in a very down-to-earth way, what comes up for us in the relational field around difficult conversations. Many of us have received judgment, uh, rejection, have been treated harshly, at some point in the past for how we've used our voice, the relational field and its identification with the separate self within the dominant paradigm can be brutal. And so, you know, we've all used our voices in ways that have led us to feel embarrassed or judged or rejected or not seen. Um, it's important to acknowledge this because through wisdom, we created survival strategies that then inform how we speak or how we're willing to speak going forth. And let's just pause and note that this is not just personally, this is collectively, um, this is historically. There's a great uh, quote that I'll share going back to the Copernican Revolution, when pe many people were killed for claiming that the earth revolved around the sun rather than being the center of the universe. No one wanted to hear that. It was so far out of the dominant paradigm. So uh, Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake for um, stating this. And his statement at the time before death was, I await your sentence with less fear than you pass it. The time will come when all will see what I see. Maybe you who condemn me are in greater fear than I who am condemned. I love that quote. <laughs> so, yes, we have a legacy of burning people at the stake globally for using their voices, for speaking truth, uh, for saying things that we didn't want to hear. Uh, we've been burned at the stake. Uh, we have that memory in our DNA. So, just to be aware of all of that, when now that today, one of the top three human fears, <laughs> fears in human consciousness is public speaking, uh, doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from these memories. And many of us have learned, therefore, to put on masks at time, from time to time. We don't have to judge the process of putting on masks, but we want to bring compassionate awareness to it if we want more freedom within the relational field. Uh, many of us lean into roles that feel safer to bring to the relational field. So just as some examples to ground this. Um, when I was a young person, I lost my father to cancer at the age of 11. Rather abruptly, he was just told one day that he had one month left to live due to a misdiagnosis. And... Uh, I went through extreme, extreme grief and confusion and added layers of confusion um, for some years going forth because I recognized that in the culture of sunshining that I lived in at the time, growing up in 
the city of Los Angeles, sun shining, pointing to let's keep things light, let's avoid difficult, uncomfortable conversations. Uh, my strategy was to become Eden, who is always smiling, to push away the grief, to not show it. That was a mask that when it was time, when I was recognized, that was a form of 100% self-abandonment that could not be true for my practice anymore. I could let that go and learn to express and be present and honor the full spectrum, the full spectrum, okay, of my internal experience. Another personal example, because I think these can be helpful, um, is that when I was uh, young, I, I became aware of how people responded to my mom growing up. I often joke that my mom, who's a brilliant artist and activist and change maker, she's one of my heroes, is also the loudest human being I've ever met on planet Earth. That's my, my joke, but it's the truth. And so as a young person, I noticed, oh, I don't live in a society that celebrates that. A lot of people were either scared of her or kind of judged her because she was not complacent. She was a, a, a truth teller at all times. Um, and so I learned to never be loud. I learned to quiet myself. I even moved to a silent monastery for seven and a half years. And it, it was actually there and during that time that I got to see, oh, <laughs> some of this is authentic. I value and cherish silence for practice. But there's a part of my personality that's learned to be very, very comfortable not speaking up. And that's when I had to break out of that mold and recognize that by judging someone else's loudness, I was judging my own. It's Carl Jung who said, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Debbie Ford said, I love this quote. If we deny our ugliness, we lessen our beauty. If we deny our fear, we minimize our courage. If we deny our greed, we reduce our generosity. Our full magnitude is more than most of us can ever imagine. So when I left the monastery where I trained for seven and a half years and moved back to the city of Los Angeles, um, I had an incredible journey uh, being there to teach, being there to live as a lay person, uh, and being there in a wildly social interactive field an incredible opportunity to take my practice off the cushing in fresh and unknown ways and transparency and really beginning to understand as a liberation practice, transparency, speaking the in the moment truth, transparency, which begins by seeing ourselves fully and clearly by acknowledging that if we are to bring our full self into acceptance, then we might want to question and let go of any habit of masking and the projecting that creates the habit of masking or leaning into comfortable roles, like the role of a leader can be a kind of mask, the role of a, a teacher can, if we use it that way, um, or just the role of someone who's super strong and um, has it together, okay? So speaking from the heart and courageous conversations always invites us into this balance of uh, courage and vulnerability, the courage and vulnerability that live in reciprocity and that invite others into this themselves. Joanna Macy, one of my teachers of decades, of many, many years, says truth-telling is like oxygen. It enlivens us. Without it, we grow confused and numb. It's also a homecoming, bringing us back to powerful connection and basic authority. So in that time after the monastery, I got to really, really learn to trust uh, the capacity true nature holds for transparency, for truth-telling in any context. It could range from anything from finding myself in um, situations with relatives I hadn't seen for years and feeling like maybe there was a field at a family gathering of, well, we could keep things surface or we could acknowledge all the pain that's happened in this family since 
past five years since we saw each other and noticing that I could find a voice that was honoring, that was loving, that was not um, off-putting to people, that was welcoming, and that could acknowledge all of that, the both and, or the voice required of me in social gatherings. If I notice an element of white dominance that's not being named, how to name that, how to bring that forward in a way that's, again, honoring, that's honoring to we, that's not finger pointing or self-deprecating or judgmental, but that's actually naming that which is uncomfortable uh, in order to feed we consciousness. We consciousness not being a lofty idea or philosophy, but the field of interbeing that we simply drop into naturally through our meditation practice. Whatever it is, it can be said with love. And the more we set down our masks and our defenses, the more we get to see who needs healing inside. Why has this mask been brought to the relational field? And that's an offering to ourselves, to the entire collective, to our ancestors, I would say. So I want to offer some practical encouragements. And I would also say, if any of you um, don't so much want to take notes right now, so you can just be here resting in full presence, um, you're welcome to send uh, my assistant an email this week. We can, we're can we happy to share a handout, okay? Just give us a little time. We're a small organization with a lot on our Dharma plate. So the first encouragement, a way that I often frame it uh, for my Sangha is that the relational fields be becomes a field for bridge building. We could say bridge building across the abyss or illusion of separation. So we show up to a conversation, a group situation, whatever it is, and we get to see a rise in this mirror of relating. Uh, projections that we hold, uh, assumptions of based in I versus you or different and other. We get to see the assessing mind, uh, putting things higher, lower, the binary perception that occurs. Um, we get to see ways that sometimes we leave ourselves out rather than belong ourselves as a practice. And belonging is a huge, huge topic. So in stating that, I recognize I could speak volumes about that, and maybe we will more in the Q&A. But that simply by acknowledging, okay, here I am, and I'm arriving with some gunk, some superficial layers in the surface mind, I need to first be willing to pause and see what those are if I'm going to bring myself wholeheartedly to this connection. We might arise, we, we might arrive and see, okay, there's projections that um, the other person is judging me or that the other person will judge me harshly if I voice something vulnerable. Uh, we might notice assumptions we're making that are feeding separation. But I feel that our first and primary job is to really be aware through our meditation of what is arising right now and how am I relating to it? That's a continual Dharma inquiry and what that asks us to see and let go in the relational field. So just as an example, uh, when a gift in my life was that the reason I left the monastery where I trained was because I, I got Lyme from a tick bite and was navigated extreme ups and downs of illness for about 10 years uh, with, before I knew what it actually was. But what was beautiful about that is at the same time that I was growing in my leadership position, in my leadership capacity, being asked by my teacher to teach so many places, I was experiencing extremely uncomfortable states within myself. I was feeling incredibly weak. Um, I was feeling uh, not so confident about no longer being the energetic Eden I had known from the past. I was feeling vulnerable uh, about having a mysterious illness, all of that. And the beauty of 
someone who held me in fierce compassion saying, you're still completely adequate to do this. That's why I'm asking you to. So I would get up um, to teach. And I remember the first time that I arrived to share with a group of people from the depths of my heart, from the heart of my being, but I needed to first state out loud. I'm really grateful to be here with all of you. And I'm also feeling uh, incredibly physically fragile this evening, really exhausted. And it feels important to name that both and so I can be fully here with you and not in any form of pretense or concern. Just naming transparently what is at the surface level that needs to be named is a really important practice. And many of you know this. Another important practical theme <laughs> is to always, always take our seats before entering important conversations. What does it mean? We each have a different pathway to grounding, to centering, to embodying presence. We take our seats before, during, and after conscious relating. As my dance teachers say, drop your anchors. That's a great phrase for this. And right now people can practice. Like, what does it mean for you to drop your anchors? From where in your body mind do they drop? What does it feel for you to take your seat? And to know how to continually come back to that in the relational field. The third encouragement is to lean into discomfort or awkwardness or whatever it is. But we learn um, that with curiosity as our guide, there is nothing to fear. And if we lean into the discomfort and again, name it, be willing to see it from the heart, then we can... Um, in a sense, normalize it, and then we can also see who in us desperately needs our compassion through this situation. Um, where is acceptance? Where is compassion needed? Or where am I projecting? And can I drop that projection? We'll go a few more minutes, and then we'll open it up um, to questions and reflections. Who's here is a very basic inquiry that I always encourage people to bring to the relational field. It begins as a personal inquiry. Who's here right now? Maybe we notice just pure presence. Maybe we notice someone who has an ego agenda is showing up to the relational field or to this conversation. I wanna be right and have the other person be wrong. Just curious, friends, show of hands if you've ever done that. Okay, I wanna be liked, I wanna look good, I wanna seek approval, I wanna not get rejected, uh, whatever it is, we have to be aware of those agendas uh, in order for us to drop into and listen for our heart's agenda, something deeper. All we have to do is be aware, okay, of who's here. And likewise, it's useful to just sense not as an analysis, I'm not asking people to get heady at any step in the game in this, but I'm just saying to inquire, who's here externally? Who am I talking to? And by that, you might just get a sense of times that you're talking to, for instance, your partner as a centered, mature presence, or a time when something has just triggered them into their five-year-old self, or a reactive teenager, it's helpful to get a sense of who am I talking to so that you can meet the field honestly and appropriately, okay? Um, speaking the microscopic truth is a really, really helpful invitation for difficult conversations. And this means that we can anchor ourselves in listening within and out in a more subtle body awareness. And 
without judgment, but being willing to rest in emergence and listening as a pair to simply name what is arising while we're talking. So what I'm present to right now is, um, I'm giving an example, folks, uh, some tenderness in my heart as I presence this topic, uh, some fear that this topic um, will cause upset. I'm present to a sensation of heat in the back of my neck, just to name without judgment the microscopic truth allows us to stay out of our heads and to meet the moment uh, with honesty and with compassionate neutrality. There's just a few more I want to share. It's a really um, powerful gift of practice, I would say, that we can learn through watching ourselves and how we operate, through paying attention to what causes, leads to suffering, and what helps us to remember who we are, our own habits of getting caught in story, and how slippery the slope can be when we are telling others our story, or getting heady about our stories. I hope people know what I'm pointing to. The invitation I want to offer is that we can, at all times actually, learn to speak more on the level of process than content, and we can find more freedom through that. Through process focus, we can share. I'm aware that when I receive difficult feedback, uh, my jaw tenses, my uh, belly becomes contracted, and I begin rejecting myself. That's an example of sharing process. Uh, content would be like, so last week I was talking to so-and-so and they said this to me and it reminded me what someone else said to me five years ago. And that reminded me of what my mom said to me when I was eight. I'm not going to continue, but we can go off into story in a way that can both unground us when taking our seats is our first and foremost consideration. And it can also take us away rather than towards the, the wound or the difficulty that is ours to practice with, to heal. There's such an emphasis on getting up, up, and away from our difficulties, from our bodies, from discomfort. The point of practice is to come home, down, down, and into experience as it is in order to remember who and what we actually are. I would like to um, share a quote from Luminous Darkness to bring this, these reflections to a close and then open it up so I can connect with all of you. And some of what I'm sharing today comes from a, a six-month training that I offer called the heart of listening. And I talk a lot about what it's meant in my life, um, certainly post monastic coming into the world with the commitment of living and teaching in the world without being of the world. That means without abiding by the collective conditioning that was not true to my heart, being aware of the intersubjective nature of conditioning, which means the fish does not always see the water in which it swims. If our neighbors, our society, uh, is sharing ideas about how we're supposed to be socially, uh, what contracts we're supposed to have with one another in terms of um, keeping things surface or not, or in terms of behaving certain ways. This dharma is a path of reclaiming the authority of the heart, the shared heart. So we need to set aside the conditioned manuals we've been given. So just to take in this for a moment, um, this is in a section of the book called From Humiliation to Humility. And I'm talking about that when we're willing to go beyond me versus you, we can experience and facilitate shared consciousness. Facilitate means to make easier. Okay. Um, 
We're all called to lead on behalf of what we love and the future we wish to create. This is true whether we're in professional leadership positions or our parents, educators, activists, artists, or members of the, fam the human family hoping to leave the world a better place. The more we move beyond binary perception, the easier we can embrace the paradigm of leading with our whole selves. We can learn to lead in the dark and be led by the dark. Research has shown that fear of public speaking is one of the top three human fears. Through the framework of conditional love, a framework in which we often feel judged, we've all experienced moments in which we felt embarrassed or feared that we would appear stupid in front of a group. The dominant paradigm teaches that leaders are not meant to experience doubt, fear, fragility, or make mistakes. A leader needs to present their best self all the time, correct? Leaders are in essence meant to transcend humanness, and this is a faulty proposition. We must also contend with the long legacy of spiritual teachers and wisdom keepers sitting on a pedestal imparting wisdom uh, in a way that can feed this concept of perfection versus failure, okay? And then people who might be called to step into leadership roles or just use their voice more openly in service in their community don't do so out of fear of humiliation that that model perpetuates, okay? So the idea is that success um, is that there's no room for uncertainty, doubt, a wrong term, or even an honest mistake. The idea is that success, similar to enlightenment, is to attain a perfect state. You're either 100% successful as a leader or must be considered deficient and a failure. Collective conditioning has taught us that if the force carrying you forward into the unknown is not based upon supreme confidence, then you ought not to move. But in reality, we all fail sometimes, and we all fail at meeting often artificial or unrealistic standards. We all disappoint at times, both ourselves and others. It's a subversive act in today's world to accept ourselves as we already are, to show up and share as we already are, okay? Rather than proving ourselves, we can acknowledge that judgment is the only thing in our way and relinquish it. We can also begin to realize that we are not the hero achieving the grail. We are the obstruction to something. That conditioning is the obstruction. Okay, everyone. Please pause. And let's take in a couple of breaths together. And I would like to invite any of you who want to bring your voice in to do so. I'd love to engage with you live. And there's also a place where you can write in a question. And so let's begin. Who would like to start us off? Marnie will be helping us with this part of things. <clears throat> um, Charles has his hand up, so let me, okay. Charles. Welcome, in. Charles. Yeah. Good, good morning. Uh, two quick things. First, can you just give me the ending of the Carl Jung quote uh, about the con um, unconscious and the conscious bringing it up? I don't remember. That. I if don't. you give me a moment. Um, yeah, okay. But I'll ask the question I have as why well. Why don't you do that? Yeah. Um, you said that it is important to pay attention to process before substance, if I understood you correctly. And in my mind, it's sort of the other way around. You look at whether it's the substance is worth actually bringing up, and then you decide how am I going to do it. Uh, Thank you. Am I correct? Yeah. Charles, if it's okay, can I clarify a little bit? Yeah, uh, you're making an important point. And first, I want to share that quote with you. Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. OK, oh. 
And then I would suggest with the way you just worded that, that it's a both and. In other words, very helpful to reflect, is this issue, that's what I hear you pointing to, important enough, uh, big enough uh, for me to presence with another person? In other words, some things are things that are ours to work out internally or to work with internally before we bring them to another. So I would say, yes, I agree with you. But what I'm talking about is a little bit different. I'm talking about that when we're sharing something, we have the choice to share on the level more of content. This is what happened or process, which is our Dharma inquiry. Our Dharma inquiry is what's happening right now and how am I relating to it? So for instance, when I trained as a monastic in the silent monastery, twice a week we came together to share process in group. We wouldn't share from the place of, so so and so said this and that happened to me and then that happened from there. And we shared what I'm looking at based on the happenings this week is how when someone gives me a certain look, my conditioning interprets it as rejection and how that manifests inside. So that's just an example. It doesn't mean it, we never bring in uh, content, but what I'm pointing to is as a facilitator and a practitioner, I've witnessed how easy it can be for people to get lost in the content or over identify with story through the content or identify with the victim through content, instead of getting to the heart of the matter, the heart is in process. What is happening now and how am I relating to it? That's where we have choice as practitioners. Does that give some clarity? Well, just to a certain degree, what I'm hearing, and if I'm understanding it correctly, is that we need to understand ourselves before we can expect to speak accurately or uh, appropriately to what is being said to us. That's a very good reflection, yes. And so, as I shared, and as we all know through experience, the relational field provides a mirror for us to see what arises in here that has been accepted, that has been left out of acceptance and wholeness, that still remains in the domain of reactivity, that stirs something from the past that needs compassion. So we do need to be taking responsibility for what is ours. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Who else? What's feeling alive for people in this? Just take a look within and see. And if you're someone who's aware of a courageous conversation that you need to have with someone soon, kind of aware of what's coming up around that, um, know that this might be a, a space for you to seek support around that. All questions are welcome and all reflections. So just taking a look with it. I, I can read something in the chat if you'd like, Eden. Thank you, Marnie. That would be welcome. Mm -hmm. Maria and says, I'm a bit confused. Can you elaborate how taking our seat is dropping our anchor when taking our seats in itself is supposed to be anchoring? Yes. Um, there might have been, Maria, just confusion of language there. And what I would say about it right now is just what I'm encouraging is simply that people remember that to take our seat is our first step when we show up to the relational field. And that means to turn our attention within. That means to ground and center, to rest into presence, to really notice if we're bringing our whole selves here. I also, Maria, use the metaphor 
of dropping our anchor. Because sometimes when people show up to that um, invitation, now I'm going to take my seat, they find that uh, their attention is really elsewhere. They find that they've gone up, up and away out of the body or that they're preoccupied with uh, things that they're projecting onto that engagement. And so I used another metaphor there. Maria, I mixed metaphors, and that metaphor was drop your anchor, just as a way somatically of remembering to come down into our bodies to give our bodies more fully to the earth below. It's a very um, similar invitation, but each of us responds differently to language, and I've noticed that some people respond to one and some to the other. We have to each find what invitations truly resonate the most with us. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for asking for clarification. And yeah. Marita, uh, Marita has her hand up. Marita, do you want to join? Hi. So I just found the microphone. Um, uh, I just have some comments from my life. When I was uh, a young adult, in my young adult life going out into the world, I often found myself, and still is, am, <laughs> uh, finding myself in a situation on the, by the bus stop, on the train, anywhere. Uh, a person shared their life story with me uh, during five, six stops, and then they got off the train. I never came to the point where I could say thank you or anything, you know. And when I was younger, it really, sometimes it really weighed on me very he heavy, heavily. Nowadays, I just see it as a, a gift, a present for some reason. People like to share their life story with me, wherever I am. Uh, so, uh, that was just uh, something I, I uh, that blew through my mind today. Beautiful. Beautiful. And might I ask you to pause for a moment and just mm -hmm. inviting everyone to reflect on those experiences, those experiences that are akin to the stranger sharing with you their life story that are akin to ordinary moments of profound depth, intimacy, and connection weaving through our entire lives. Mm. Is there anything that comes up for you, Marika, about some of the qualities that you show up with, or even a quality that you show up with, that you sense makes the door open for that? Yeah? Yeah. Uh... No, when I when getting when I was young, I wasn't aware at all, and sometimes I I just felt overwhelmed. Uh, but nowadays I I realize that for some reason I have an open open mind, and I don't mind. I don't mind, really. Beautiful. <laughs> so just that open mind and mm. open. Many yes. of you listening are aware, or um, or less so. That just by having a practice <laughs> that's made you someone who is more of a receptive listener, who mm. is more of a spacious presence, who energetically someone can simply sense as a little more uh, safe than someone filling the field constantly with uh I, I, I. And so there are so many ways that having a practice, whether mm. we're aware of it or not, uh, makes us more, the phrase I'll use is responsive presences in the shared field. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. 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 I'm going to go to the chat and then we'll call on Jane after. That sounds so great. Yeah just to kind of weave it through. Um, Josephine asks, and there's two parts, so let me read both, and that mm -hmm. I think will get the whole question. Okay. 
Can you explain how the quote dark can help with the themes that you brought up today? I'm drawing on another talk that Eden gave to Sangha Live based on her book. How might the two themes relate or reinforce each other? Sure. Um, I'm not uh, entirely sure of which quote, but I'll share what's arising for me right now. And it's that when we're talking about the luminous darkness and when we're letting ourselves uh, redefine dark from the conventional higher, lower, good, bad, positive, negative kind of categorization we do, we really sense into through our practice, what is the luminous darkness? We recognize this field of deep receptivity and restoration that is uh, true to the yin aspect of nature and consciousness. Now, the yin doesn't exist without the yang. They exist in constant interplay and dynamic relationship. But in the dominant paradigm, the yang has been very much held as higher. And so in this conversation today about speaking from the heart, we are touching the interplay between receptivity and deep listening, and how from there we can allow ourselves without holding tightly to a script or a plan to rest in not knowing and let speaking from the heart be an emergent, emergent exploration, resting in receptivity and allowing our expression to come through us. No deed there is, no doer thereof, not doing it as an I or separate self, but being the vessel for it. So thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Was there one more? Yes. And we have Jane with her hand up. Um, I'll bring Jane on. Okay. Hello, Deborah. And okay. thank you so much. That was really beautiful. I got a lot out of it. Um, one of the things that really struck, struck me and strikes me about um, Buddhism and meditation is the intertwining it has with psychology. <laughs> um, I'm a psychotherapist, and when you shared uh, how you were dealing with Lyme disease, I thought that was so beautiful because one of the things I learned very early on when I started as a clinician 30 years ago was the importance of being authentic and sharing, you know, today I'm feeling kind of tired or physically not capable or whatever. Um, but I thought that was really beautiful. And thank you for sharing that. Um, my qu not question, but I just am curious. Um, I see often how challenging ba setting boundaries can be for my clients. And I think there's an art form of all of the things you talked about with also expressing how, ways of sharing ways of setting boundaries with compassion and love and not to in, hurt the other person, but to in, come with this uh, sense of being honest and authentic. I'm wondering what you think about that. Yes, um, setting compassionate, clear boundaries. Often this is an expression of fierce compassion. We work with both gentle compassion, our listening, our receptivity, the simplicity of being with, and fierce compassion, Manjushri sword, which cuts through delusion. Um, and in my experience, the first thing I would offer is that we become really badass at setting conscious boundaries the more we become badass at setting those boundaries with our own conditioned mind. And until that time, it's going to be hard for us. So if we're aware of this as a constant uh, within and out, being aware of where conditioning is getting in the way of authenticity, of truth, of honoring life, that's what calls what is needed forth within us to set that boundary, to say no, to the voice in our head and from love, but clarity, no. And to say clearly to another, um, I need this space and time for myself 
to honor my vitality and wellness, or I need to have a particular boundary. I love you, and this honors my sense of well-being and capacity to be here and serve. So we learn to do it quite easily, but not unless we can do it within our own minds. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And I think, yeah. like you said, it's really pointing out we're, uh, the relationship will be healthier if I set this boundary. Then I might be able to come back to it with with um, a more ability to share my authenticity. Thank you. We, we get to recognize what is in service to life itself. And life includes the we, all of us. Yeah, yeah. I'm Thank happy you. to go a, a little um, further and then we'll need to bring it to a close whenever you gauge Marnie and I'll make a couple closing announcements at that time. I think that we've covered it. I, I'll look through the chat. Okay. But, um, I've given your website and a link for Donna you today? Well, I want to say a couple of things. Um, oftentimes, when I teach a song alive, I allow more time for Q&A. And I found out today, speaking from the heart, that there was a lot to say. So thank you for your listening today. And I'm always welcome if there are any burning questions that arise for people afterwards or things that need clarification, okay, to reach out to receive a communication. I want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, I just know from witnessing the communities I'm part of that we're all doing our best to navigate, um, finding both more compassion and courage in the relational field, and that there is a great deal of polarization right now and divisiveness. So I want to express appreciation for all of you who are doing the work. And I want to thank Song Alive and also say something. Um, Marnie's sharing my website and their retreats and offerings. And also, as I mentioned, a longer training called Heart of Listening, a two-year training called Listening to the Invisible. That's for people who are um, specifically in leadership positions and really interested in post-patriarchal relational leadership and relational mindfulness. And I think what I want to offer um, before we dedicate the merit of today's practice is just to say a little something about Donna. I know from witnessing Song Alive, like how much work has gone into for so many years, making what happens here happen. And it's an extraordinary organization. I've worked with many Dharma organizations. The quality of teamwork and the quality of spiritual friendship, Kalyan Amita, and simply the efficiency. <laughs> They're really good communicators. A lot goes into this. But even just knowing the money that it requires for them to store teachers' talks and to facilitate um, teachings. By the way, in December, we're having a Luminous Darkness online teaching that will go just for a couple of weeks for those who want to make note of that. Donna, which is the practice of generosity, is what has fueled and supported my Dharma practice from its inception as a young person who at times in my life needed resources from others to support my monasticism, to support my training, to support teaching to support being able to give scholarships to those in need. This is one of the joys of my entire life right now is um, people in the community giving Donna to support others in the community to deepen in practice. Uh, it's a circle of reciprocity in a world where that is not so much modeled economically, and it truly expresses the uh, essence of kindness as the, the backbone of this, this path. It's revolutionary in this world. And so the invitation is just to look within and to learn again through that same deep listening we've been talking about, like what is right amount for me to give for what I receive through practice and the teachings. You have a sense of what would be too much, maybe a sense of what would be not enough. What is right amount, okay? 
let's close our eyes for a moment. And just feel our appreciation for this community, for this time. How about appreciating yourself for showing up to this? Yeah. For valuing the realm of conscious communication. And I would like to dedicate the merit of our time together today, the quality of compassion and community and respect and courage within this field to all beings across time and space, to all beings visible and invisible, near and far seen and unseen, recognizing that we practice on behalf of our collective, leaning into the support of our collective in this together. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>